Good afternoon. Thanks for coming for this presentation. Uh, it's titled Design Patterns and Best Practices for Data Analytics with Amazon EMR. Uh, my name is John Fritz. I run product management for the EMR team. I'm joined here with Anya Baida, who's a senior member of the technical staff at Salesforce. Actually, real quick, before we start, by a show of hands, um, how many folks are running Hadoop or Spark or Presto today? Show of hands. OK, wow, that's great. How many folks are running it on AWS today? Still a good amount. And then how many are running those workloads on EMR? OK, great. So we're going to go over a couple of things that might be a refresher for some folks who use EMR, um, but then go into some new features, some best practices and design patterns that, that we see. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Anya, who will talk a little bit about um, you know, using uh, Amazon EMR at Salesforce and some interesting patterns and best practices that her team has come up with uh, when deploying and running these workloads. So I guess to begin, um, just a real quick overview, you know, what is Amazon EMR? So EMR is a service in AWS, makes it easy, cost-effective, and secure to run uh, big data processing, machine learning, real-time processing with the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. Um, you know, a couple main points, you know, easy to use. You can spin up a cluster in a couple of minutes. You can use the uh, AWS console. You can use the AWS command line and literally just in a couple of lines say I want, you know, one to thousands of Hadoop nodes in a cluster and start it up. Um, it's also low cost. Um, this slide used to say uh, a couple months back per hour pricing. It's actually now per second pricing. About two months ago, along with EC2, uh, EMR now you pay per second. You can shut your cluster down and stop paying for it immediately. There's no hourly boundary anymore. Um, we've got a variety of open source software. So I think right now with EMR 510, I think we're at 19 open source projects. We actually just added support for MXNet. Um, and we have a new release around every four to six weeks. So that means that the latest versions of the open source projects um, are available in EMR pretty quickly. That's important because like, you know, if you're a Spark developer, every new version of Spark has a variety of like, oftentimes critical bug fixes and other new functionality that's important. So um, you know, we won't force you to upgrade, but we make a new release available um, about every four to six weeks. Fully managed, you know, we replace nodes, we'll auto-scale your cluster. Um, Secure, we'll talk a little bit more about some new security features that have come out uh, a little bit later. And finally, it's flexible. You know, the goal is we want you to be able to easily create a Hadoop cluster and just start writing applications, not really worrying about configuring things and um, you know, uh, troubleshooting and that sort of stuff to get the cluster up and working. But if you do want to, say, change all of the default settings or even install custom components, uh, we're not going to stop you. You've got root access over all the boxes. And you can even use a custom Amazon Linux on me as well. So there's a lot of variation. You can go from taking all of our defaults, and Anya will talk a little bit about some of the default configurations for Spark. Um, but you can also change everything. Um, kind of moving from the open source application, I've, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but quickly just the way that we kind of organize you know, EMR, that we've got um, you know, a bunch of EC2 instances will spin up in your account. Oftentimes, we'll process data in S3. Um, you've got a variety of different cluster management options. Uh, Yarn, which you know will run MapReduce, Spark, Tez, everything on top of that. But also HBase and Phoenix, you can run NoSQL clusters. You can use Presto, which is a uh, distributed low latency SQL engine. Um, now you can run MXNet for distributed training. Um, a variety of front end tools like Ganglia, Zeppelin, you know, if you have notebooks, you have SQL, develop, uh, SQL editor, um, table browsers, that sort of stuff. Um, and then connectors to a variety of AWS services. And so um, you know, you can say uh, use Spark to directly load Redshift using the Spark Redshift connector, which uses under the hood uh, the unload command for Redshift to get really good uh, uh, throughput from Redshift into S3. You can use uh, an open source. We actually open source this sometime this year, I think. Uh, our Hive Dynamo DB connector, so you can query and do uh, big data analytics on your tables in Dynamo DB. Um, you know, you can use uh, Scoop to go access data in your MySQL databases. Um, but one particular um, connector I want to focus on is AWS Glue. And so AWS Glue, uh, great service. It has a couple of components, actually three main ones. Uh, one is an ETL service where you can you know, not write any code and drag things together, create uh, serverless ETL pipelines. The one I want to focus on here is the AWS Glue Data Catalog, which is a fully managed um, Hive Metastore compliance service. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, crawlers, which crawl data to infer schema. So before the Glue Data Catalog, what many customers would do is run an external Hive Metastore database in RDS or Aurora. And that was great for a couple of reasons. One is you could shut your cluster down. All of your metadata was you know, persisted. You could bring it back the next day. You wouldn't have to recreate your tables. Or if something happened to, say, your Hive Metastore um, MySQL database running on the master node, you'd have the extra durability and availability. But with Glue, all of that's fully managed. 
and you actually have a, an intelligent meta store. You don't need to write any DDL to create a table. You can have Glue just crawl through your data, infer what the schema is, and create those tables for you. Um, you can also have it add partitions. One thing that could be a pain is if you're constantly updating your Hive tables, you have to have some process to kick off the DDL to load that new partition in. Uh, AWS Glue Data Catalog can do it for you. Um, you can have a variety of complex data types that it supports as well. And so with EMR 510, which we released last week, um, we have support not only now for Hive and Spark, but also for Presto. So you really can full, full stop, move all of your um, kind of data cataloging that you might have used the Hive Metastore component for to AWS Glue and EMR. And that's a click in the console or some, you know, a couple configuration settings. Um, so moving from Glue, just going over a couple of, of newer use cases that we're seeing as, as well, or some kind of just design patterns. One is um, utilizing HBase for random access at, at massive scale. And so we see a lot of customers uh, running HBase using HDFS, which um, you know, historically that's the only underlying file system that HBase could write out its H files to. Uh, in the past year, we've added support for HBase to utilize S3 as an object store um, instead of HDFS for H files. Um, and then also the ability to use a read replica HBase cluster in another availability zone. I mean, a great example of HBase on S3 is FINRA. FINRA, um, the financial regulator in the United States, um, wanted to have uh, low latency access over you know, trillions of records um, to be able to basically pull out a couple of records and see the relationships between the two. Um, you know, they're running a very large HDFS cluster. By moving to S3, they were able to save, I think, around 50% or so on their storage costs because instead of sizing the cluster for HDFS, um, they could size it for the amount of power they needed out of their region servers to be able to serve the data. It had a much larger footprint in S3. With read replicas, which is a somewhat newer feature um, that happened later in this year, you can spin up a read replica cluster in another AZ and either load balance writes so you don't overload one cluster with all the requests, or from a DR perspective, you know, you want to architect, if you can, for availability across AZs. S3 is available across a full region. So you don't need to replicate the data twice, which you'd have to do with HDFS and have two full HDFS clusters in each AZ. You can spin up a smaller read replica cluster, point it at the same set of H files, and drive uh, you know, reads through there uh, in the case of a failover situation. Um, another use case that we continue seeing a lot of growth for is just you know, utilizing the EMR platform for real-time and batch and data exploration. And this is kind of one, one diagram that we see customers oftentimes building out where you have Kinesis and you push Kinesis into Spark. Spark streaming um, has a uh, built-in connector for Kinesis but also for Kafka as well um, to do your real-time analytics, maybe some data processing on the fly, but then dump that data into S3. And if you don't really need to do any real-time processing, honestly, Kinesis Firehose is, is, a, is a great use case for that as well, just getting the data in there. You get it cataloged in the Glue Data Catalog, um, and then you have it basically open to a variety of different analytical engines. So, you know, EMR has a bunch, like Hive and Tez, Spark, Presto, we'll talk in a second about what some of those diagrams are for, but once it's in the data catalog in S3, you can use Athena, which is, you know, serverless SQL queries. Um, you can use uh, Glue ETL, which is for serverless ETL, um, or even Redshift Spectrum as well. But we see a couple of main use cases for EMR. One, um, data exploration with Spark. So. Um, with Spark um, and uh, the, the availability of the Zeppelin notebooks, or you can easily bootstrap on a Jupyter uh, notebook and utilize Livy, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, you can arm your data scientists with an ad hoc way to interact with a large amounts of data. You know, Spark, instead of being using like one data science, large data science node, you can scale out those jobs across the cluster. It also makes it easy to then move into production as well, because then you can templatize those clusters and then run them on a regular basis. Um, we've seen a big rise in using Presto for ad hoc SQL in combination with Athena. I mean, they kind of uh, approach the same thing from a different angle. Presto gives you kind of advanced configurations and the way to really build exactly what you need for a use case, but you have a cluster to manage and you have to deal with some of that. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's a little bit overbearing. Versus Athena, you just go to the console and start writing SQL. Uh, Presto now supports LDAP authentication and uh, in-trans encryption, so you can use it for a HIPAA-eligible service. And there's uh, many BI tools that are now integrating with Presto as well, so you can have it power low-latency dashboards. Um, and finally, just you know, batch processing. Oftentimes, the end place might be into Elasticsearch or Redshift, which is really a more optimized data warehouse than, than what Presto can do, um, and utilizing Spark again to go, or Hive to go transform the data and then load it into any of the other endpoints.
One final use case that we're starting to see adopted, and this is something new with uh, the release last week, is deep learning use cases. So EMR for a long period of time has done large scale machine learning. We've had Mahout and MapReduce for a long period of time. We supported Spark, I think around in 2015. Um, but as of last week, now you can launch GPU hardware in EMR. And we have support for MXNet. And so um, you know, why use EMR for a deep learning platform? Well, oftentimes you need to do feature engineering before throwing things into uh, whatever model you're trying to train. And because you have things like Hive and Spark co-located with things like MXNet uh, on the same cluster, you can easily run your full end-to-end -end data engineering um, into whatever machine learning models you want to use. Um, we actually released a blog post yesterday. I highly encourage checking it out um, about running uh, Spark and MXNet together for uh, distributed inference. And so we're going to be supporting TensorFlow uh, hopefully next month or sometime soon. And then. You know, once again, you have full control over the clusters. You can load up a custom AMI with all sorts of deep learning libraries or other custom uh, packages you have and run the cluster with those as well. Um, so kind of moving from, uh, I guess, design patterns, a couple tips to lower your costs and things that we oftentimes encourage customers to do um, as they're optimizing their workloads. One is thinking about whether you have a transient cluster use case or a long-running cluster use case. We see a lot of both. I mean, some people think, well, EMR is really meant to be a transient you know, job flow engine. That's not true. We have people who are running clusters for, for many, many months at a time. The real question is, is, do you need the nodes up or not? If you're paying for a Hadoop node that's not doing anything, you're just burning money. And so we encourage people to think about, are there ways you can batch up your workloads together uh, like in this case, you know, you take an inventory of the different jobs you have and say, I can make tweaks to make it so that certain things run in a batch, um, a batch mode, and I can shut the cluster down in, in between those times. Um, and then I can separate out the things that might need, say, an always-on cluster, like uh, an ad hoc cluster for people to come to uh, that you can maybe use auto-scaling with um, to, uh, to, to give that, but, but not size it to where it's running everything. So one thing is just thinking about if you're running a cluster, could you be shutting it down and not paying for it? And if you can, you should do it. Um, another thing is utilizing EC2 spot. Um, it's a great way to save uh, money off on demand. Oftentimes, I think up to 80%, you can really get a good discount uh, on spot. The one caveat is, is that it's possible that the spot market will take the instance back. So if you have an SLA-driven workload that cannot withstand any failure, um, you know, that spot might not be the right call. But oftentimes what, what you can do is you can say, well, odds of failure are pretty low, and you know, Hadoop itself can handle several node failures, and you should run task, uh, task nodes that don't have data nodes so you're not impacting HDFS. But still, there might be a failure. You might lose a bunch of nodes. Spark might not be able to recompute a data frame. Um, having the logic built in where you can just kill the cluster and create a new one maybe with all on demand, and for that one job, it's more expensive, but for the first, you know, the last hundred times, it ran fine and you got to save a lot. So sometimes thinking a little bit differently about how can I, like, templatize uh, the architecture so I can quickly kind of recover if something happens um, is pretty doable and, and oftentimes is recommended if you're using Spot and you're dealing with uh, a workload that's pretty SLA bound. Um, but what I really want to talk about is a feature that we released earlier this year uh, called instance fleets. So uh, instance fleets is similar to spot fleets. Um, they're not the same, so we're not actually using spot fleets, but using kind of the fleet mentality, which is we're not, you're not going to specify the uh, instance to use. You're going to give us a list of instances, and we're going to do the best we can based on availability of instances to give you some combination of what you want. This is actually a, a screenshot from the console where you can create and define one of these fleets. And the problems it solves are, are actually three main ones. Um, that we saw you know, a lot of customers, or customers at times running into that we wanted to solve. One was, um, you know, when you select one instance type and there's either not enough spot instances or um, things are starting to be reclaimed, EMR will continue trying to, to get that instance for you, but it might take some time. And so what the instance fleet does to address this use case is, is well, you've given us you know, four or five different choices. You provided a weight to say I'd take you know, eight R3 X larges or one R3 eight X large. And we'll do the best we can to provision across all of that to get that end capacity that you want. Um, second one is AZ capacity. You know, if your data is in S3, you can launch an EMR cluster. In any AZ, you might have a subnet. Um, but how do you know which AZ is the right one to launch based on capacity and other heuristics? So you can give us a list of AZs, and we'll choose the one based on heuristics that we're watching that we think is the best one to launch the cluster based on what you asked for. Um, and a final use case might be, I really want to have spot, but if I can't get all the spot instances, I still need to run the job and I'm willing to pay full price. And that's where the switch to on-demand feature comes in where you can say after 30 minutes or something, if I can't get all the boxes I want, 
to switch to on demand. I, uh, I'll pay full price, I get a discount on the part that you could push into spot, um, but I really need to run the job with all the capacity. So if you haven't checked out instance fleets, it's a little bit more of an advanced feature. Um, it's you know, more things to think about than instance groups, which are literally just, what's your instance type? How many do you want? Um, but it's a powerful thing, especially if you're running very large spot clusters and you're running them kind of on the fly. This helps around a lot of provisioning uh, issues that might come up when you're running at scale. Another um, kind of best practice to use for, say, long-running workloads, or even transient workloads to some degree, is auto-scaling. Um, EMR auto-scaling utilizes some of the application auto-scaling features under the hood, um, but we stitch things together ourselves. You don't have to go in and configure CloudWatch. You basically tell us what you want to do, and we do all the stuff on your behalf under the hood. Um, there's a variety of uh, CloudWatch metrics you can use, like yarn memory, or we have actually a ratio of, uh, I believe, containers pending to containers active, which is kind of a proxy for, if you gave me another node, would I have any yarn containers to put on it? And if so, give me the other node. Um, so we have a bunch of CloudWatch metrics that make sense to use, but also um, you can push custom metrics to CloudWatch. So one example is uh, there is no CloudWatch metric yet for like aggregate CPU on the cluster, but if you've installed Ganglia, there is. And so you can pump that to CloudWatch and scale on that. Um, a couple notes on auto-scaling. So before 5.10, um, we actually had an option where you could scale in at instance hour, which has since been deprecated. That was a feature that we built when there wasn't per second billing and you might not want us to take away a node that you've paid for before the hour is up. We've deprecated that because there isn't really a use case for that anymore with 5.10 and beyond. Um, what we do when we scale in, when, when you've given us the right parameters and we say, all right, well, the metric is where you told us to scale in, which nodes do we take? We actually look to see which nodes aren't running any yarn containers and take those first. Um, if a node is running a yarn container, we're gonna wait until that value, yarn.resourcemanager decommissioning timeout, um, which is set to one hour, wait up for an hour, and then if no node is free, we'll say, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna take that one and kill the yarn container. If you had a use case, like say you were caching a large Spark data frame, which has all the yarn containers up, and you didn't want us to take it, you can set that to an arbitrarily high number, and basically it will never take a node away that's running anything. So it kind of depended on your use case. Um, a couple other uh, things as well. Um, for Spark, uh, there used to, we found some customer issues where when you're scaling Spark in and say it was in the middle of a shuffle, blocks would be lost because we'd, you know, Spark would say, cool, take this node away, but it actually would have data on it that you would need. So we're actually in the process of pushing a lot of this back out to open source, but we built some optimizations into par Spark scale down behavior to where it's more resilient. Uh, it understands a little bit where shuffle blocks are. And in the case that there is an error that could be recomputed, Spark won't freeze and kill the job. It'll do the right thing and start retrying certain actions. Okay, so we talked a little bit about cost saving strategy. Um, now moving on to a little bit overview on security. Um, and so uh, and we'll talk about a couple of new features too. So the first, uh, encryption. So EMR um, supports end-to-end -end encryption for a variety of different frameworks. Um, this is just a quick diagram, and I'll actually show in a, in a two second demo of like how it's just in a couple clicks you can configure all this. But it's a diagram useful to know, you know what's actually being encrypted. Um, you can configure S3 encryption, server side or client side. Um, we encrypt all the local disks of your cluster, so any executor spills or HDFS blocks that are written all get encrypted on the local disk from the Linux, Linux file system. Um, and then we've got, uh, we, within, the, within the last release, when you enable uh, in-transit encryption, we'll encrypt Spark, Tez, MapReduce, Presto, HBase, Hive, and Pig. Um, so all the kind of blocks that are flying across the wire um, are all encrypted. Now, because we set up the um, SSL cert configuration, if there actually was something we weren't encrypting or something that you've installed that you would need, like let's say um, Hive Server 2 or something like that, you're connecting via JDBC or you need some sort of uh, web UI encrypted, oftentimes just through configuration you can flip it on and over time we'll add more of that into the security configuration as well. So for every release we have a note of the actual things we're encrypting. Definitely check that out. We add more things you know, oftentimes every release. From an authentication point of view, a lot of customers come and say, you know, how, how do I authenticate my users? You know, it's the EMR step is pretty straightforward. At the bottom, you use your AWS credentials. It's an AWS API and that's how I authenticate myself. But from the Hadoop stack, you know, I've got you know, 200 business users and they all want to run a Hive query and connect via JDBC, what do we do? So I just wanted to quickly put up a slide showing kind of the groupings of some of these things. Uh, we do support LDAP for Hive Server 2, Presto, the Spark Thrift server, Q, which is a front end where you can, you know, query UI, and Zeppelin, which is a notebook. Um, some of these things you need to configure through the configuration API. Um, we have in, I think, our docs information on how to configure that to have it connect out to your directory. 
Um, we also have, if you're SSHing, the EC2 key pair, you SSH in um, as Hadoop, which is, and if you run an EMR step, the user is also Hadoop, which is the super user. And so we have a new feature that we released last week, um, which kind of addresses some of these things. There's a big enterprise ask from our enterprise customers was, can you support Kerberos? Um, you know, it's great that you can SSH in as Hadoop, but really what we want is to do a cross-realm uh, trust with our AD and have all of our corp users uh, come and SSH in as themselves, and we want to audit them to know who ran the Hive query that took down the cluster and that sort of thing. So, um, or more importantly, data governance. And so we, uh, in our last uh, release 5.10 last week, uh, we've got support for Kerberos, um, and with a couple clicks, you can launch you know, a thousand node Hadoop cluster that's fully Kerberized. Uh, we uh, install the KDC on the master node, we store all the service principles there, and then if you want to do a, a one-way trust with your Active Directory, um, you can do that, and then you can you know, SSH in as yourself. And so uh, we're excited about that feature. Um, this quick diagram showing kind of uh, uh, high level cross, cross, uh, cross realm trust. Your user runs Spark job as himself, yarn impersonations enabled, and then now you're, you're seeing exactly what's going on by the user who ran it. Um, and then, kind of to conclude on the security overview, we talked about encryption, authentication, um, and now authorization. Once again, a bunch of different modes depending on what you're trying to do. You could be in a storage-based world where you use the ACLs or permissions on the storage level to determine whether you can run the job or not. HDFS supports ACLs, you can configure it. Um, EMRFS we'll talk about um, in the next slide, um, so we can skip that for now, but that's S3 access control. Um, Hive Server 2 and now Presto in the latest version support SQL standards-based access control. So that's, you know, this guy can access this table, this column, uh, kind of at a SQL grain. HBase supports cell level. Yarn has queues with Kerberos. Now you can authenticate who's putting something to Yarn and make sure that they don't put it in the wrong queue. Um, at an EMR cluster level, you can use IAM and tags to say this IAM user can't terminate, you know, an API action, terminate cluster with tag X. You can do that. And then finally, um, you can install Ranger on a EC2 instance. We have a CloudFormation template that can help. Ranger is a kind of policy engine for Hadoop where you can configure each application directly but Ranger kind of makes it a little bit easier because it's the same interface basically for creating all of this and then install plugins as well. So you can, you can uh, use a bootstrap action to get that in. Um, but the final new feature that we released last week is back to EMRFS storage-based access control. And that has been another major ask from customers who have the use case where they have a shared cluster, they're running Sparks, there really isn't any tables to use, it's kind of arbitrary data frames. Um, and they really want each user who comes in to assume a different IAM role to limit what they can and can't access in S3. And so what this feature does is um, you can basically specify users or groups, like Hadoop users and groups on the cluster, and say, if I'm going to use EMRFS to access S3 in the context to say, group analyst, use IAM role analytics prod, but if it's user, say, dev, use a different one. And so that gives a kind of more fine-grained storage-based access control. Um, real quick. Actually, I'm not sure we have, uh, we have time, but um, what I was going to show you is in the console, um, there's a uh, uh, view, basically, one page where uh, it's a security configuration. And what you can do is all the things I've just described, you basically check a couple boxes, choose the key that you want, the SSL cert you have in S3, you click Enable Kerberos. If you have a cross-realm domain, you've got to provide you know, the address of where things are and the name of the realm and the domain of your AD and the users and groups you want to map to, to uh, the roles, and then you save it with us as a name, so my security configuration. When you create a cluster, you can reference that name security configuration. You can create thousands of clusters with that same configuration. So it makes it easy and quick to preserve this across many clusters. Um, so just wanted to end with a couple of things that we're seeing customers doing on submitting workflows. Um, the first is a new component that we've added recently called Apache Livy. Um, and Livy basically serves as a Spark job server. Um, actually, for a long time, we've had uh, several customers who've been bootstrapping on a component called the Spark job server, which was open sourced by a company, Uyala. Uh, eventually, then Livy came about um, to kind of, we, and we think that's the right, the best technology for, for doing this sort of stuff. What it does is it, it's an HTTP endpoint that you can interact with in an ad hoc way. And what Livy will do is it'll create the Spark session and manage it, you can create multiple ones. And on the request, you can name what Spark session you want to submit, you know, uh, whatever interactions you want uh, to go run. And so it's super useful if you want to build a cluster to basically serve the backing for an application. Or if, say, you're running Jupyter off cluster, you can use the Spark magic kernel, point it at a Livy endpoint, and then you have now an interactive Spark cluster to use with your notebook. 
Um, you know, one last thought is for more complicated DAGs, you know, one question is, you know, EMR Step API, it does one thing, it does it pretty well. It runs your job in sequence. It doesn't run, you know, jobs that are uh, in parallel, but it will be an API to basically serve the run jobs. If you have a really complicated DAG you want to run, we see really two, two options that are, that are very popular. One is Uzi, which we support on the cluster. Um, Uzi now supports workflow definition files, which are these XML files in S3. You can spin up a cluster, reference it in S3, and start running a complicated DAG. That screenshot actually is from Hue. Hue has a pretty robust UI to go design these jobs. Um, but also we see Airflow being uh, a new popular one. Airflow is open sourced by Airbnb and now recently is an Apache project. And we see customers also spinning that up on EC2 alongside their EMR clusters. And it also has the intelligence to provision an EMR cluster. So within your workflow, you can define, you know, create a cluster, run these sorts of jobs, and then shut it down all from Airflow. So both are pretty powerful tools. If you have these sorts of more complicated data flows you want to design, uh, definitely take a look. So anyway, that's um, kind of a, a little bit of overview. Talked a little about security, spot, auto scaling, a couple new features that we have, and a couple of new components. Um, Next, I'm going to turn it over to Anya to talk a little bit more about Apache Spark and EMR at Salesforce. Great. Thanks, John. Nice work. Hi, everybody. I am Anya. I am on the infrastructure side at Salesforce. And I'm really happy to be here to tell you about how we use Spark with EMR. So we, Salesforce is a CRM company, customer relationship management. We're obsessed with customer success. Because when our customers are successful, then we are too. Um, so that's what we do. Um, I'll give you an overview of the pieces that I'm going to cover today. I'm going to tell you our goal when we're, um, we're trying to deploy a machine learning pipeline and how we kind of chose Spark and EMR. I'm going to get just level set and show everybody how to get started with EMR pretty quickly. Um, this might be review for some of you, but it'll be pretty quick. Um, I'll go through a quick Spark primer just so that we're all on the same page there. And then the best practices that we've kind of distilled from using Spark on EMR, um, namely monitoring multiple environments, uh, I'm sorry, monitoring our environments with multiple viewpoints, uh, using IAM roles, the identity and access management, um, and isolating environments. So that's the overview. Let's get started. So our goal, we wanted to create a complete machine learning pipeline. We wanted ETL, feature engineering. We wanted to train our models, but also we wanted to evaluate and deploy and operationalize our models. So this was, this was kind of a requirement going in. And we needed to select a tool that would support, uh, allow us to reach our goal. And also, um, we needed a tool that would scale for small jobs, large jobs, a tool that had built-in machine learning libraries so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and a tool that had a great user base, et cetera. So for us, Spark was the choice. And so, okay, we wanted to deploy Spark, but how? <laughs> so we started out with EC2. We started out creating um, Hadoop clusters and uh, running Spark there on EC2. And that was working for a while for us. Um, it was great that we could spin up clusters, large clusters, small clusters. We weren't limited to um, the machines that we had in-house. Um, but this got to be a little bit unwieldy after a while. We started to have more and more clusters and started to dedicate more and more people to managing them. So what we ended up needing was management of all these pieces. We needed a service layer to manage that. And again, EMR was the key there. Take a drink of water. So okay, let's get started with EMR. Let's provision. So honestly, the best uh, way to, that I think to get started with EMR, um, go through the wizard, click through and take the options that you want, but then click on that um, AWS command line export button and you're gonna get a command line that has all the, all the flags that you selected through the wizard. And this is kind of the simplest command line to create a cluster, a AWS EMR create cluster. And we're gonna create a cluster with uh, Hadoop and Spark and Ganglia. Ganglia is great for monitoring, so go ahead and use that. I added some notes, um, when you're using tagging, um, go ahead and tag for cost analysis. So all of our EMR clusters are tagged with like four tags, you know, environment, um, use case, uh, project. It really helps when I'm going through and deciding how much money am I spending um, on which project or in which environment. So the tagging is really useful there. Um, send the logs to S3. Um, naming, again, choose kind of a naming convention that will help you as well. So maybe a naming convention would be region, project, version, environment. Um, and that is really handy for templating your, your automation, for service discovery, um, and then for that cost planning again. 
Next, we're going to select our instance groups. So we've, I'm going to select core nodes and task nodes here. And I just wanted to point out quickly here, so the core nodes are actually going to be used um, for HDFS writes. So the core nodes are running the data node service. And I'll show you kind of a diagram of this in a little bit. Um, whereas the task nodes are just for the compute. So it might be wise to try spot instances here for the task nodes. OK, so that's just provisioning EMR. Sounds good. Um, this is kind of the simplest approach when we think about our, how we use EMR, <laughs> super simple. I've got my data in S3 in my input bucket. I'm gonna read from that. I'm gonna run my job on my, on my EMR cluster and I'm, I'm gonna write to my output bucket. Right? And I'm gonna send my EMR logs over to S3. So super simple. Um, so my Spark job is running on my EMR cluster. Let's talk about that a little bit. You're probably all familiar with this Apache Spark diagram, right? So you've got your driver that's going to run the user code, the awesome data scientist that created this awesome application that's going to run on the driver. And the driver is going to communicate with the cluster manager, in this case, Yarn, to negotiate for some resources. Um, and then uh, the, the executors will spin up, and that's where the work is actually going to happen. The tasks running on the executors are um, going to do that data computation that's needed for a particular partition. Okay, so that's kind of just a real quick uh, spark overview. Well, I took that diagram that you know and love, and I just created my own. What I'm gonna do is map this to my EMR nodes and see how that works. Because a lot of the time I get confused when I think of, oh, there's the spark driver, but then there's the EMR master. How does that work? So here's my EMR um, diagram. Um, I've got my master node and my core nodes and my task nodes, and I've just got one of each here for simplicity. Um, I just wanted to again point out on the master node, I've got a couple of special services running. Uh, the, the resource manager and the name node services are running on the master node. So EMR has done this for me. I don't have to worry about that part. And then again, as I pointed out earlier, the, the core nodes are running the data node service. And you see that the task nodes are not. Okay, so how does my Spark layout happen here? So. Um, I put my Spark driver, I can put my Spark driver anywhere, right? Um, I put it here on the core node just to illustrate that the Spark driver doesn't have to run on the EMR master node. They're actually distinct items. Um, and then I've got my executors running. They can, executors can run on any node. Okay, so that's kind of my layout. I gave a talk once about um, how Spark defaults are not recommended. Well, EMR defaults with Spark are usually recommended, just as like an overall statement. Um, and one thing that EMR does for me is it it's enables dynamic allocation by default. So dynamic allocation is um, scaling out the number of executors and scaling in according to the number of nodes in my cluster. The other thing that EMR does for me is um, sizes my executors according to the instance types that I've chosen. So I, I want to choose this instance type, but here's how much I want to pay. Well, my executors are sized automatically. And that becomes really handy for making sure I'm getting the most utilization that I can from my cluster. OK, and I talked about dynamic allocation. So these are some of the parameters that you would have to set if you were going to do that on your own, but I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> And then the next step that everybody wants to know, well, how do I troubleshoot? Where do I find my metrics? Where do I find my logs? So the metrics are pretty much all set to CloudWatch. Everything is there. Also, I've suggested that we check out Ganglia. Um, so Ganglia is really handy for creating windows and dashboarding. With Ganglia, I can understand at the cluster-wide level, is my workflow kind of limited or um, bottlenecked? at the CPU level, at the network level, at the disk level. So that helps me kind of get an, idea, get an understanding of the, of the cluster-wide level. Um, and then I can also use you know, other tools, JSTAT, um, StatsD, for going into some metrics at a deeper level. OK, what about logs? So I'm really happy as of EMR 5.8, I think. Um, I can see my application history in the, this format, so, so all, the, all the logging information in the, in the easy to use web UI format that you see here, um, I can see that even after I terminate my cluster. So I'm done with running the cluster, uh, I don't wanna pay for that anymore, but I wanna come back and look at the logs. So that's pretty handy. Um, of course, I'll, I'm also sending my logs to S3 so I can query them there as well, but, but this is a nice way to click through. Um, you might have seen the, the, the application, job, stage, task uh, words floating around with Spark, but I wanted to throw in a slide to kind of illustrate how those are defined, because 
it was baffling to me for a long time. So here's a slide on the anatomy of a Spark job. This I borrowed from a book, High Performance Spark, by Holden Caro and Rachel Warren. So it just, I'm just showing how each of these levels is kind of defined. So when I start my, my Spark uh, session, there I've got my Spark application. So that's, the def that's how the Spark application is defined. Um, when I do an action, that's how a job is going to de be defined. And you're familiar with Spark, there are actions and transformations, and Spark is lazily evaluating all of your code, right? So you can do all the transformations that you want, but until you perform an action, um, Spark will, won't do any work. It's kind of like the 16-year-old teenager who says, yeah, I'm gonna do my chores, kind of do, do some lazy evaluation. They won't do it until they're actually pushed to really do it. Um, and that actually is actually helpful with Spark because Spark waits to do um, what it actually needs to do. So if you say, um, you know, read all this data and then filter on the first row and then print out the first row, Spark's not actually going to read all the data. Spark's only going to read that row. So that's very useful. Okay, so anyway, back to the diagram. So, so that's actions and transformations. When I call an action, that's going to be the definition of a job. And then within the job, there are several stages. And stages are defined, defined by wide transformations. Uh, a wide transformation, you think of it as a shuffle. So a transformation where um, the child partitions depend on an unknown number of the parent partitions. So that's your wide transformation, and that's going to define a stage. OK, and then stages are made up of many tasks. And that is the, where the real work is happening. That's the computation to evaluate one single partition. So typically, you've got one task is running on one core. Um, and so that task will take the data from that particular partition and use the core and, and do that evaluation. OK, so that was the Spark primer. So getting back to my simple approach diagram. Um, I've got my data in my input bucket, my EMR cluster in my output bucket. So my input bucket, I'm going to read from S3. Um, make an, I want to make a note here. I don't want to read too many small files from S3. That's, you might have encountered that problem. Um, also, I want to load my jar files to S3. I don't want to load my jar files and fill up my, um, the disk on my EMR cluster. So I'm going to load my jar files to S3 as well. The EMR cluster, that's... Um, what do I do about writing intermediate files? So the next slide, I'm going to go into this a little bit more. Do I want to, do I want to write my intermediate files to memory or disk locally? Do I want to write to HDFS? Do I want to write to Amazon S3? So we'll think about that in the next slide. And then the, the output, I'm going to write my output to S3, so pretty simple. And that's handy, again, because once I'm done with my compute, I don't have to keep my cluster running, and my output is still available. So that's. That's great. Um, so let's think about that writing intermediate files step. So if you're using Spark, how many people are using um, data sets? Uh, maybe a couple. Anybody using data frames? OK. And anybody still using RDDs? <laughs> a few dedicated <laughs> developers. So, um, so you're familiar with, with data frames and data sets. So as you know, they. Um, the data frame is, a, is an abstraction that allows me to um, take, the, take that RDD and actually um, do some optimizations there. Actually, I'm not doing the optimizations. Spark is doing the optimizations for me. So the Catalyst Optimizer is going to um, think about op the best way to create that DAG for me so that I don't have to shoot myself in the foot by doing a join and then a, a filter. <laughs> okay. So that's really handy. And then data sets is that next improvement that um, then provides the type safety. So with RDDs, we had type safety. Um, with data frames, we didn't have type safety anymore. But with data sets, type safety is back. Wonderful. OK, so let me get back to my original point. How do I write my intermediate files? Well, whether I'm using RDDs or data frames or data sets, I need to think about writing my intermediate files as an RDD, actually, because data frames and data sets are going to boil down to an RDD in the end anyway. So I want to think about RDD reuse. Do I need to reuse my RDD? This uh, if, I've, if I've got an RDD that's going to take a long time to recompute, then I might want to uh, save it. Uh, if, I've got, if I've got a noisy cluster that has some network interruptions, I might want to think about saving it. And so these are the different ways that I can kind of save my, my RDD. I can cache, persist, checkpoint, or just to throw you a curveball, I could local checkpoint. <laughs> so, okay, I'll let you read the slide later, but, but suffice to say that I want to 
I want to um, persist when I want to improve speed, and I want to checkpoint when I need to improve uh, for tolerance. So if, if my jobs are slow, I'll go ahead and, and persist. But if my jobs are failing due to out of memory or this partition doesn't fit in memory or network connectivity issues, I'll think about checkpointing. Now, do I want to do that? Do I want to save my RDD locally, or do I want to save it to external storage like HDFS or S3? Well, if I need my RDD to persist after the, that job is completed, then I need to save to external storage, whether HDFS or S3. Um, if I if I just want to um, delete my lineage graph, but I want to continue with that RDD in the same job, I can go ahead and use a local checkpoint in that case. So those are some considerations. Um, do I save to HDFS or S3? Well, it depends on the use case. Um, HDFS, I'm saving relatively locally compared to S3, um, but S3 is, has more durability, maybe more availability, so there's some pros and cons there. So that's, I guess it depends on the use case and the SLAs that are needed there. Okay, so we talked about our goal um, at Salesforce to create a complete machine learning pipeline. Uh, we, we're doing some getting started with EMR and we did a quick spark primer. So now let's talk about monitoring multiple viewpoints. So what do I mean by this? So I'll use the example of a camera. Typically a camera has a single lens, and so I can just um, use one focal point to understand my environment. Well here I want to encourage you to use multiple different perspectives. This camera has 16 different lenses, so I can use lots of different focal points to examine my environment. Okay, so let's dig into that. Let's monitor multiple viewpoints at the level of understanding our resource allocation. So here I've got um, my Spark container, and I, I borrowed this diagram from a couple folks at Duke University. I really like the way it shows inside the Spark container, how is memory utilized? Um, so I think as of, I forget which version of Spark, they deployed the unified pool. So if I wanna use my memory for storage, or if I wanna use my memory for executing the job, excuse me, for executing the task, um, I've got this unified pool. So let's say, oh, I need more for storage. That pool can be adjusted and, and use more memory for storage. Okay, so that's understanding the resource allocation inside the Spark container. But what if I just take a step back and take another perspective? Let's look at the Spark container just as a big blue box. Let's just say, hey, it's eight gigs. I just wanna know, is my container gonna launch? I'm a data scientist, please run my job. Okay, so let's look at that. Um, is my eight gig container going to launch on this cluster? I've got a three node cluster, eight gigs on each node, and my data scientist might say, hey, my job should launch, my container should launch. Well, no, actually, there's four gigs that are already used on each node, and so there's not eight gigs on a single node for you, I'm sorry. Um, we'll have to wait until more resources become available, or we do some auto scaling. So one suggestion here would be to scale out according to the number of containers pending, and I think John mentioned that as well. Um, thinking about monitoring multiple viewpoints from in another in another way, um, this is a, a connectivity viewer that a tool that one of the team members, Bipop, on my team built, um, and he just built this tool so that we could see, okay, for each node that is represented by a circle, what could that node connect to? Um, and and I could see, oh, I've, I've got these three kind of clusters: dev, staging, and prod. Ah, it's great that I don't have any connections allowed from prod to dev. Um, and if I did, that might be a red flag. I need to go and look into that. So monitoring from multiple viewpoints is pretty handy. Um, I'm gonna skip through the next couple of slides so I can get to the end, just showing the different ways that we can use the connectivity viewer. Um, and then I'm gonna jump to actually using, using the IAM roles. So let's talk about that. So here I've got, we think about permissions and um, uh, IAM stands for identity and access management. So, so authentication and authorization. I typically think about that as a, applying to a particular user. So my user can access my job scheduler that I built before Livy was available. My user can access uh, my cluster manager, what spins up my EMR clusters. Um, and that's all managed by the IAM roles. But that user is going to schedule a job to run on my EMR cluster. That particular job has to have some IAM role as well. And so that's, that's something that we don't always think about. And not only that, the job is gonna run, and that job is going to end up reading or writing to some S3 buckets. So, so at every stage of the, of the pipeline here, um, we have to 
employ these permissions. Um, the scheduler itself has an IAM role. The EMR cluster has an IAM role. So every user, every service, every job should have specific and auditable permissions. Um, and I really want to check out the new feature that John just mentioned, the EMRFS fine-grained access control. So I'm super excited about that. And if I, if I want to create my cluster uh, with an IAM role, here's how I would do it. I would use the service role flag. Okay, so now let's talk about isolating our environments. This is kind of um, how we productionalize our deployments. So let's say you need, you've got multi-tenancy. You're thinking about deploying different apps for you know, different customers in different parts of the world, whatever. You need multi-tenancy. Or for us, um, I'm, gonna, we're, I'm gonna use the use case of a, a build and release pipeline. EMR is actually part of our pipeline. So if I deploy some configuration to the dev environment um, that's wrong or buggy, right, I need to check that out um, and tease that out of my, of my cloud formation or my, or my Terraform um, templates before I deploy that to prod. So we actually do have a build and release pipeline that includes EMR. So um, how, do I, how do I set this up? How do I isolate my environments? I'm gonna create a, set up a VPC. Um, I, I've got a block of IP addresses that I'm gonna use for all of the services in my environment. And I'm gonna use subnets. So um, a, a, a smaller subset of the, of the IP addresses allowed in the VPC. And this allows me to isolate even the scheduler from the EMR cluster. And then I'm also going to use security groups. So I'm gonna say, oh, this, the, the scheduler security group can talk to the EMR cluster only on this port. Or, or with my security group, I could allow, you know, from an, a particular subnet. So just, you can see lots of layers um, of isolation here. If I want to spin up my EMR cluster, here's the flags that I would use. Um, and if you're interested in security, you're probably using the private uh, security groups. Or, I'm sorry, the private subnets. So just the flags there. And this is basically my environment. This is what I consider to be my environment. Um, and I want to build this in dev and staging and canary and prod. And you can see all these configurations. I need to templatize this, <laughs> otherwise I'm gonna be making mistakes, right? So let's go ahead and automate that with CloudFormation or with Terraform. And also, when I wanna upgrade EMR or I, I wanna spin up a new cluster, um, I'm gonna essentially use the same provisioning script that I was using already the, in the black boxes that you've seen. Um, but also, I'm going to do a blue-green deployment. So I'm, my new cluster that I spin up, I'm gonna do a DNS upsert so that new jobs are routed to the new cluster and the old jobs kinda of play out on the old cluster. So that's, that's the automation there. And it becomes really handy when I want to deploy in multiple different availability zones and multiple different regions. You can see why I really need that, um, those template, templated autom uh, automations. So this is what we talked about today. We talked about uh, monitoring multiple viewpoints, using IAM roles, and isolating environments. Did we just automate ourselves out of our jobs? Well, no, so now with all this automation with EMR, now I have time to go and explore new projects and grow and um, really, really have a lot of fun at Salesforce. So with that, I will thank you for uh, all your attentions and John and I will be around for questions.